Hey everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, joining us today, we have Simon Salstrom from the Direct Ed Development Foundation. And Simon's organization helps to identify high potential students in Kenya and Ethiopia, and I think also a variety of places maybe. I don't know what other plans you have, uh, but you so try to support them with the resources and training required uh, to start successful careers as remote software developers. Um, you do that through the power of um, online technologies, uh, Web3 tooling. So just really excited to have Simon here joining us to talk about uh, Direct Ed, what Direct Ed does to help people um, in these regions uh, become better trained uh, to start their careers and uh, sort of what they do with the technologies that they work with. So thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'll just start by, I'll share my screen, um, but I want to also just give you guys a bit of background on, on you know, what I've done and before I, I decided to go on this path. So I am born and raised in Stockholm, Sweden. I have had opportunities in life and had a stable upbringing and a loving family. But that's not the case for most people around the world. And that's something that I got to see firsthand. First, when I moved to China, I lived in China for a year uh, back in high school. And I saw how, how hard, um, tough life was there. Uh, but that was just really like a glimpse, right, into seeing a different part of the world. Um, after that, I, I, you know, the more you look for it, the more you see it. And I, I met some kids actually from San Diego a few years later after that. One, one guy told me that on his 13th birthday, he got a bag of meth and a, a gun from his uncles. And they said, you have to go and sell because... You have six siblings and a single mother. Uh, you're the oldest son, right? So uh, throughout my life, I've really thought of it as uh, I have been given a lot of opportunities. So I will be in a position to kind of give back. So after I finished my master's in economics at the University of Oxford this uh, summer, I decided against going on this traditional nine to five route earning money by moving money around for people who have too much money so that they can earn more money. I was like, nah, that's not really what I want to do. I, I think I can do something more meaningful so that I can look back and I can say, uh, I made a difference. What I did mattered at the end. So that's what really the, the kind of backstory between directed is. Um, we are all bound or we're kind of united by this idea that we want to work to build a world in which any person can realize their full potential regardless of the draw in the lottery of life so now let me start the sort of actual presentation what it is that we do so the problem well in the west and in particular in europe we, there's a lack of IT professionals. And to be more precise, we're talking about 500,000 IT professionals are estimated to uh, uh, be missing. The shortage amounts to half a million. And as you all know, the COVID pandemic has accelerated the acceptance of remote work. So in a recent survey, 38% of companies are looking to hire more remote workers in the next two years. Now, this is all a great opportunity for Africans, but there are many issues and challenges. First of all, there are many talents out there, but how do you find them? If you, let's say you want to invest in these talents, who do you invest in? Because it's not easy to do coding. You have to have a certain prerequisite. And there are a lot of people who don't have the resources, both in terms of computers and world-class education. But moreover, even if you come from this very charitable, you very well intentioned, uh, well intentioned um, kind of entry point, there are to, are a lot of middlemen. Unfortunately, corruption is um, everywhere. There was a study from 2019 World Bank study. They looked at highly aid dependent countries and foreign aid inflows and offshore bank account outflows, and the correlation was quite clear. Money comes in money goes out to these offshore havens. The elites pocket a lot of money. 
Um, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. It happens throughout society. So we want to get some way to, you know, get around that problem. And then lastly, lack of accountability. Uh, the unfortunate reality is that you can't just give people money and you can't just trust them. There needs to be some kind of accountability measures, but that's costly. Usually that requires a lot of uh, money itself. Uh, there's a charity called New Incentives. As much as uh, half of the costs involved is overhead. And by overhead, I mean checking that uh, the, the charity uh, or checking that the recipients of these cash transfers are actually getting va the vaccines. So their model is get a vaccine. If you take a vaccine shot uh, for your kids and yourself, then you get a cash transfer. But you know, if if you have one dollar coming in, fifty cent is for the cash transfer. Fifty cent is for just checking that they actually did it and all the sort of. Um, accountability measures revolving around that. So what our solution is, is the following. Scholarships for coding boot camps using digital self-sovereign identifiers and blockchain technology. Now, let me break that down. How does this work? Well, in the first step, you have donations coming in to scholarship pools. So this means that you have a specific school and a specific coding course. It could be Kagumo High School in Kenya for full stack JavaScript. This is gonna be tied into a, something called a smart contract. And a smart contract is simply a piece of code that says, if these conditions are satisfied, then this will happen. Like, and uh, you'll see exactly how that could play, about, play out. Um, at the same time, as we, gather donations, we have a selection process. We select um, and do research on this. This is something we're actually trying to figure out as to what are the predictors of coding bootcamp success. But we have a selection. And as they enter the coding bootcamp, they get milestone-based scholarship stipends. So only if they reach certain learning milestones do they get a verifiable credential showing, hey, this student knows this. They then share this with the smart contract and the smart contract says, okay, sure, you learned what you're supposed to do. You're, it seems to be like you're upholding your end of the uh, sort of contract. So you get now a next batch of a scholarship and that stipend or that, the, that, that batch is what allows the student who, who might not have um, that much money for transportation or might need to pay for internet to continue studying. And then they find a job. Now I'm simplifying here, but ultimately that's the goal. As they find the job, they get uh, you know, presumably higher income. And so they can share a part of that income and pay back to the scholarship pool, financing the next generation of students. And that's also why we work with high schools because we think there is some degree of loyalty to where you came from. So you would want to you know, support the kid who's in your, who, who, who is sitting where you sat three years ago. So there's more sort of, a more personal connection and then i as an academic myself or uh, as the background i think it's very important that you have rigorous impact evaluation now before i move on adam can you remind me how much time we have um, just so i can pace myself sure. uh, we have until 10 30 but you can um as long as you want to go okay. so we have we have another hour and 15 minutes Okay, okay, that's that's quite some time. Um, so why identity? Like, why does digital identity matter? And why, why, why use blockchain here? Well, first of all, identity. Self-sovereign identity is a new concept. Uh, I'm not going to try to go too much in depth into that. But in essence, it's a way of having building identity that does not rely on a centralized database where, where say, you know, the government or something like Facebook has uh, all your data. Rather, it's based on people signing documents with the cryptographic keys saying something about you. So it could be anything. I could sign a uh, some something called a verifiable credential to Adam saying that Adam is a great lecturer and then he can um, show that document to someone and then someone can cryptographically prove that 
it was issued, uh, or they can verify that it was issued by me, Simon Selstrom, uh, by checking against my sort of public address. Uh, so they can link it back to me. Now that allows you to build reputation and that's important. But in our case, we are interested in making sure that the money is reaching a specific person and conditional on a certain set of criteria, like that they know what they're doing. So because the problem with Cardano or not Cardano, but uh, any blockchain solution is that you do get full traceability and transparency, but at, on the receiving end, it's usually an alphanumeric string known as a wallet address, because that's also the reason why, you know, Bitcoin and these other cryptocurrencies are considered um, somewhat uh, interesting for criminals to use, is because sure you can see where money is going on the chain, but but you don't know who is controlling a, a given wallet. So as soon as you can link a wallet with some form of digital identity, well, then you have assurance, you have transparency that is meaningful. There are some issues with this, and that could include privacy, which is why there are now protocols with very interesting designs. It's one called uh, Midnight, uh, launched on Cardano, but there are many other ones that combine the benefits of this traceability and transparency with good privacy preserving properties. So, so in short, why identity and blockchain? Well, identity and transparency by design is what increases trust um, for among donors because they know that, well, the money is actually going to a person and that's not trivial. Um, in the, in the case of, uh, when the Americans pull out of Afghanistan, for example, turned out that the Afghan Afghanistan army had been saying that they had a uh, hundred soldiers in a platoon or like in a, in a you know in a group, but uh, when it turned out that that was like twenty soldiers, and the officers were pocketing the salaries, the you know the supposed salaries of eighty. Same thing with uh, you know across the board, they were like, yeah, we have fifty cars, we need gas for that. They didn't have 50 cars. So, you know, we want to make sure that the very basics are in place, that we're sending money to someone or a donation to someone. And once we do that, there's more trust uh, that this is useful. And more directly, by having this peer-to-peer -peer ability, like you cut out all the middlemen, you cut out the bankmen, you cut out um, the local uh, vendor, you also get reduced fraud. You get less of this kind of corruption, the middleman taking a cut. And so you get more efficiency. So per dollar donated, you just get more uh, return, higher return on, on this in, uh, investment, essentially. Now, one thing that I we think is important is to you know report back as well. Uh, a lot of charities kind of say, hey, you know, thank you for donating, here's a PDF. But we think we can do better now in today's day and age. So we have continuous milestone progression reports, uh, and a nice dashboard for the donors. So you can have a look and see the students they're supporting. We also want to make sure that we're not just relying on an anecdotal evidence, as is very common. We want to do this properly and have rigorous impact evaluation. Because at the end of the day, what we care about is helping people. And it's not helping anyone really by if if charities in general just you know kind of hide part of the truth. They they have incentives to not reveal the full truth. They want to make sure that they get more money coming in. Sure, it's for a charitable cause, but one has to think about the alternative costs or the different uses of the same charitable funds. There needs to be efficiency, uh, even if you are human uh, humanitarian. And that very simple idea is, is uh, was known as effective altruism, uh, a movement that has been sort of under attack now for due to certain recent events. But uh, I think the very big picture approach is extremely sensible, uh, which is assuming you want to do good, let's try to do it as efficiently as possible, like not waste money. Okay, so what we've done so far is we've signed a memorandum of understanding with Kagumu National High School in Kenya, and I'm going uh, next. I'm not right now. I'm in Kenya in Nairobi, 
Uh, and next I'm going to Ethiopia to visit Kotebe University and their model high school to do this, this kind of first piloting of our technology and the boot camp itself. We have also built out a uh, scholarship donation pools page, as you can see here on the left and a progress tracking page. We can see on the high level, each high school and sort of milestone completion progress. Ooh, I'll just briefly, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll do that on the next slide actually. So we have also in the spirit of making the donor experience more um, enjoyable, we've decided that we're gonna have a, an art collection. So if you donate, you actually get a, a small art piece. Uh, it's also known as a non-fungible token in the blockchain space. These are associated, they're not just a JPEG, but they are on chain and they have certain uh, unique uh, characteristics. Well, actually, let me put it this way. If you have them in your wallet, then you can get access to certain perks or benefits or see certain pages. All of the ones, even the warriors, uh, give you access to the donor's progress page. So the progress page is not publicly available. You will first have to log in, like log in by connecting a, your crypto wallet to the page. If the, the web page, the front end detects that you are holding this uh, NFT, then you'll be able to access this uh, progress page and see the students. And this means that you know, rather than gifting away a donation for an organization, which I know a lot of people do, and I've done myself, and then just send a PDF saying that, hey, 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 my mom, I donated in your name. You can actually send an NFT to them and they can actually go to a web page and unlock some features. Now, for the Lion Heroes, the, the ones here in the middle, we're going to do more. It's going to be a bit fancier. So we have actually gone to the schools and we asked the students to write stories about these uh, lions. Like, because, you know, this is just an image, but who who is this? Why did this lion become a hero? What is the, what is the legend? So we asked them to like come up with something. And so they've done so, which means that the donor will get the story and the name of this lion alongside the art piece. But we didn't stop there. We decided like, hey, let's spice it up even more. So if you donate enough, then you will be invited to an annual donors dinner. So that will be taking place in Oxford. That will, uh, you know, perhaps incentivize some donors to, to bump up their charitable donation a little bit. Now, Roadmap wise, not super interesting. Currently working on building out the product and then in the next year pilots in the two high schools and scale out. Here's, this is a you know, very traditional pitch, but essentially we're looking at $1,500 for an entire boot camp and a graduate scholarship. And we expect kind of the success stories to be earning $5,000 per year, which is Mm, uh, something like 50, 60% higher than, than what the normal student would earn. But this is very much, this is hard to, to estimate. This is really hard to know. Um, so just take it with a grain of salt. Now, yeah, so as I said, this is a more like traditional kind of pitch deck where, I, where the goal for me as a CEO is to convince various actors and stakeholders or donors to give me money. So we have to have a slide like this saying we have tons of experience. We have four Oxford master degrees across us. We have three PhDs working with us and young African leaders initiative followers, uh, fellows. Now, I think this is uh, you know, pretty okay place to stop. I have some more slides, but uh, that's something we can leave for questions and answers instead. All right, well, thank you uh, so much. I'd love to open up the floor for questions from the students and have you guys ask uh, anything you want to know about the project and about the technology that Simon is using to facilitate this. 
And perhaps you can start with one, Adam. To of course, on. nobody wants to be the first one, so I'm going to have to. Um, yeah. So tell me a little bit about your selection process of how you select these students for your boot camps. Do you look for people who have some sort of interest or experience in blockchain? And or is this uh, and, and I guess in general, is there a um, a large amount of knowledge about blockchain already out there in the communities that you're reaching out to? Or do you have to start from scratch with teaching them about it? Um, we're not selecting on the basis of blockchain interest, per se. Right now, I think there's not that much public knowledge in terms of what predicts success. I've spoken to you know, some senior curriculum design leads at established boot camps, and they say two things. Uh, number one, um, just willingness to work hard. And in particular, he likes to ask, what is your what will you do if you don't get in? Like, what is what happens if you don't do this? They, you need to have a strong why. Second one is logic. You have they have to be strong in logic. Um, but right now, what we're doing is we're just using the national exam results, very merit based in mathematics and in English. So they have to have above a certain threshold, A minus, in order to be eligible for a boot camp. What we'll then do is we'll gather data on cognitive skills, uh, very traditional, like IQ, similar to IQ tests. Also, there are motivational letters, uh, teacher predictions. We'll ask the teachers, who do you think would be like, you know, good candidates? Student peer predictions, uh, personality traits, like big five, um, possibly measures of grit. Um, and loads of background data, essentially, in order to hopefully find good predictors of success. But I think the most important one will most likely turn out to be the coding, one week coding bootcamp that we're hoping to do for all students, essentially. So we're opening it up, giving everyone a chance to have a go and then use that kind of results. So we'll have a quiz at the end of that week, one week to see you know, who, who persisted, like who's actually interested enough. Um, uh, when it comes to blockchain knowledge, because I think that was the second question, I asked when I visited Kagoma High School, there were uh, 390 students taking the national exams. I think it was around some 30 students maybe that had heard about blockchain and, and kind of knew something about Bitcoin, but not many. So when we had to, so so that meant that we had to train them or educate them in blockchain, uh, and that's that's difficult. I've I've now done that uh, as part of the Oxford Cardano Student Hub over the past year. So I've built up a bit of a repertoire and some experience, but it's not hard. It's not easy to do it in a succinct manner. Um, and we tried. We did some experimentation uh, in regards to onboarding these students. Uh, they did not have phones because they live uh, in, in dormitories and uh, boarding school. So we had to first explain to them how to do that. And then we tried have it was we had a completely new computer um, that was just for onboarding these students. So they got to set up their wallets, write down the seed phrases on a piece of paper and then um you know and then we'll kind of reset and let someone else do this and, and now we'll go back in like a month's time and see how many students still have their wallets um uh, but the idea is then that they can you know go home and they can redo the process on their own computer if they want uh or or use the same but but um but that's the that's sort of in so far as onboarding uh, comes that's what we've done so far Cool, that's excellent. Uh, you mentioned how the um, funds that are providing for this program are being um, traced through the blockchain to show accountability. Are funds, scholarship funds given directly to the students in a cryptocurrency or are they converted to the local currency before they're given to students? Yeah, that's a good question. Right now, they will be given ADA. So that's the Cardano native currency because there is no stable coin right now. 
um, the point of the project is to have this kind of they have agency. So there and in Kenya there are plenty of ways you can off ramp and you can turn your ADA into local currency. And in fact, because of the foreign reserve shortage, you know, like uh, there is a premium um, at, associated. So they will actually get more in terms of US dollar equivalent by getting donations in ADA at the moment. In the longer run, we will be uh, donating, uh, we'll be accepting donations in stable coins. And so that's what they would be using. In Ethiopia, the situation is a bit trickier. And the reason for that is because the regulatory environment is much more uncertain. So what we will do is, is most likely some kind of voucher system um, where the students at the point of uh, sort of receiving the donation, the money, the ADA is being converted to a voucher. And that voucher can then be used with a uh, with an, uh, a like like regulated uh, importer or exporter who can convert the voucher that they have into local currency. So that's that's sort of the way we we just to make sure we are on the, on a regulatory point of view, or not uh, breaking any laws. Or well, right now it's in a gray zone, but but this is something I'm discussing with. Uh, uh, with the people in Ethiopia. Very cool. So I think I think that's that's one of the things that is. Um, uh, I mean, it's a bit of a challenge. Uh, you can't really use ADA to purchase things, but in the longer run, our hope is really that some form of cryptocurrency becomes the standard like standard way of transacting. I'm using mobile money here in, in Kenya. I'm trying it out, but the fees are quite high. So if you send, um, let's say 500 Kenyan shillings, the fees for that is around 25 or something like that, uh, Kenyan shillings. Uh, so we're looking at uh, 5% uh, fees, which is very, very high. Um, and and so, you know, it, perhaps cryptocurrency could could make a dent on the market payment solutions market, and uh, you know more vendors can accept these donations or the money, the crypto money, crypto US dollars. And um, yeah, inflation is high in these countries, so that is a reason why uh, I see at least the possibility of. Uh, low-income countries wanting to adapt crypto uh, because it is a bit of a you know high cost to entry like to learn it initially yeah that makes a lot of sense um i'm curious what are the you you mentioned that there's plenty of opportunities for the um, uh, off off ramps and on ramps for converting the uh crypto assets to the local currency what what would the typical person in uh, these countries have to do then to go over like to mobile pay, for instance, um, just as an example. Um, so the typical person, well, essentially what would happen is, is semi-formal informal exchanges. So that we're talking peer-to-peer -peer groups. Uh, it could be telegram groups, but it could be more more formalized marketplaces where they send to an escrow account and uh, you know you give directions here's my mobile mpesa number and then on the other end they send so so there's a, like a list right here here's here's the here's what i'm willing to sell here's what i'm willing to buy and then you engage in that way um there are really good technological solutions there's a company called kotani pay and they have integrated crypto they have a full end-to-end -end crypto to fiat uh, solution so their wallet can receive it's a um, ussd based wallet which means just uh, any phone can use it like dumb phones and old phones um, so that you can receive money to your mobile phone and you can convert that to mobile money if you want and you can interact with kind of blockchain uh, as well through your uh, dumb phone 
And so that's that's the, in the longer, slightly longer run, uh, where uh, I had met with them earlier this week, and they're looking to integrate Cardano into their sort of ecosystem or solutions as well. Cool. And so I know that you've been involved in the Cardano community, and you've um, I've seen you get a lot of support uh, in um, setting up with uh, you know Cardano as the blockchain of choice for this project. Or were there any other blockchains that you thought you would want to incorporate, or are you going to stick with Cardano? What What do you see about this uh, space when there's so many options, and why you chose the one you chose? Uh, for me, it boils down to the strategic focus of Af to uh, to focus on Africa uh, of Cardano and the scientific rigor and the peer review research that underpins the blockchain. Uh, on the first point, if you work on a blockchain or work with an ecosystem that has similarly aligned values and priorities, then you just find more synergies. You find more people interested in doing similar things. Uh, when it comes to the scientific peer review, I mean, that kind of approach, rigorous approach, I think it makes sense. Um, move fast and break things is fine if you just have a web application and this the cost of making a mistake isn't like $100 million because that's literally what we're talking when we have smart contracts, bugs, or small things that just have gone wrong. And that's why we have, I think, upwards $3 trillion being lost in various hacks. Many of them are bridges, but and then if you talk to people who are in these other ecosystems, they say, yeah, it's just a bridge hack, but it boils down to the language that they use, these languages that they are building on are, are more prone to errors. Whereas Cardano from the building block or from the very kind of uh, base layer is built to avoid the possibility of even making any silly mistakes or um, allow for bugs. Um, by building it on Haskell uh, makes these things easier. So for these reasons, that's why Cardano was the choice, but um, there are other good blockchains that could probably be used as well, but um, you know it's hard to have a good overview of all of them. At the end of the day, my my general take is that by and large, all of these modern layer ones do something very very similar, which is they right you know allow for smart contracts. There are debates uh, that are important. Uh, but if you only care about the smart contract functionality, then they're very similar. Then you can talk about decentralization. You can talk about governance. And I think these value propositions will, will uh, in the, you know, we'll see uh, which kind of layer one wins out. Uh, what do people really care about? And where are the users? Okay, right on. Um, I also was curious about your NFTs, the uh, the Lion Heroes um, that you give to your donors. You mentioned That's how that will um, open up uh, opportunity for the um, donor to have a story that was written by one of the students. Um, how do you store the extra information? And um, is that encrypted? Is that something that they, when they unlock it, is it something that only they have access to or can other people read it as well? Right now we haven't decided exactly on how we want to do it. I see NFTs in general as simply as like a signed copy of something. It's kind of like, you know, when you, when you have a book, you get a signature from the original author. Uh, but anyone can really buy another book that's that's kind of cheaper or like a copy online. Uh, and similar, similarly with these things, uh, they are, you know, JPEG is a piece of data and anyone can actually get access to the NFTs that are being sold generally. Um, I... Yeah, so, so with that said, I think the images are, are always in public domain. Now, whether or not the stories should be in public domain, that's, um, you know, I think I think that's going to be based on what the donors feel uh, like they want. 
um, what we might do is we simply give, give give it encrypted to them just to make you feel special. And then if donors want to share it, they can do it. But I think I'll, I'll talk more with the people who are, you know, the donors, and then we'll figure things out. We could do it either way. Um, cool. Yeah, no, I like that you have that sort of like still figuring out that part of the project. It's a ambitious plan. It sounds like fun. Yeah, definitely, definitely. All right. So I'll invite others up if there's anybody else who has questions. Yeah, it's okay if you don't want to ask about <laughs> uh, ask about this. Uh, if you want to ask about something else, I. Where are you calling in from, actually? Oh yes, so this is uh, we're all in um, Urbana, Champaign, Illinois. So right. this is all for we're all at the University of Illinois, um, and this is an on-campus class. So we're meeting online today because you know it's more convenient to meet with you this way. Um, so I told everyone to stay home in their pajamas, um, unless they had a previous class, then I suppose that they had to get ready. Uh, but um, normally we meet in the information sciences building. Okay. Okay. And what course is this? Uh, this is um, web technologies and techniques. So it's an overview of the World Wide Web and how it develops, and just a, a, like I said, a broad overview of the various technologies that are found on the web. And so um, I figured it would be fun to end the semester with some talk about web three technologies and looking at blockchain and decentralized applications. Mm, right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, uh, really, well, uh, blockchain is is a shared backend uh, or it's a, it's a different way of having a backend that is more transparent and it reduces friction between so rather than having siloed companies where that controls data, you just have a shared database. So it's a, it's a huge win for consumers, but it's, uh, I predict, uh, harder for businesses. It's harder to build businesses for this very reason. Come yeah, it's consumers in, in the same way. It's a huge shift. And I think part of it is that part of it is that change in mindset of, having to release control to a large degree of the information and realizing that you're going to have to share it with everybody else that you're in cooperation with. Um, part of it is just quite honestly, um, having to build up new stacks, right? We have a lot of uh, different technology stacks that are already established and people have find it very easy to just grab a template and build on that template, whether it be a software or hardware template that they can build on. Um, and we're still coming up with the way we want to do that for Web3 um, because everything right now is an experiment. Um, even Bitcoin, you know, it's been around for what, 13 years now, but that's still relatively young in terms of technology. Um, so uh, yeah, um, it's, it's, it's fun to see that shifting mindset. Um, and then the other thing is just, um, sort of like getting people um to understand what's out there and what the options are so yeah 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 it's uh, i think uh, some people compare it to the early stages of the internet so yeah. some people say oh why is it blockchain and it's you know it's been around for so long but if you look at the internet well i i, I don't want to quote on this one because i don't know the actual year internet was found but it was like late 80s right or early 90s well, it depends on how you want to look at it. Night um, at the University of Illinois, I think we use we often like to claim 1994 as one of those dates because that's when the modern web browser was invented at the University of Illinois. So ah, uh, yeah. So that's right. But you can trace the origins of the internet back, of course, to the uh, U.S. Department of Defense's research in the 60s and 70s, even. So yeah. It's it's been I think ninety four is a good number. Ninety four yeah. is good, reasonable. Yeah, I think. And then if we put the equivalent, so let's say Ethereum uh, launched in what was it twenty fifteen? Um, twenty fifteen. I think it launched in twenty fifteen. I think they were developing. Yeah, late. I think December, like late twenty fifteen. And so that we're talking, uh, well, like so, so, so seven years from that initial first kind of thing. And if you look 1994, okay, and then you have the IT bubble back in 2000, 2001, 
So, you know, it kind of kind of matches up like somewhat, somewhat okay. Um, mm -hmm. and, and similarly, if you want to, some people date the internet back to like early 90s, well, then you can say, okay, well, let's look at Bitcoin. That was like very, very beta. It's a kind of first iteration. Um, and then, you know, so, so I think there are some interesting parallels. You can also look at the number of users, like 1999, 400 million or something like that in internet. And then, okay, today, crypto, 400 million. Yeah. But um, who knows? Who knows? Maybe it's uh, not useful at all. I don't know. <laughs> we'll yeah, see. Uh, we'll see what the use of the way of Betamax. Uh, well, uh, we had, uh, I'm very excited to see your usage of self sovereign identity in your projects. And that's something we don't need to get into right now because I know we'll, we'll just wrap this up in the next couple minutes here. Uh, but uh, we might have to have you come back uh, maybe next semester or something to talk about self sovereign identity and the work that you are. Um, doing to develop that in the space and, and giving people access to that. We had um, a lecture on that on Thursday and a discussion on Thursday, or I'm just last week Thursday about that. So it's mm. it's a fun up and coming technology, and I think it's going to be hugely impactful in the way that people are able to represent themselves. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I hope hopefully uh, it'll gain traction. All right. Well, hey, everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, Simon, thank you so much for your presentation. It was excited to hear uh, what Direct Ed is doing. Um, and I'll let you go. Uh, but uh, for everyone else, uh, we'll have like a little quick wrap up here. So yeah, it's been a great time.